All right. Well, good afternoon, and thanks so much to the ICS for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here, and I hope that this is useful. Um, I, there's probably a range in the audience of experience levels with social media, so hopefully there's a little bit of something for everyone, whether you've never, ever tried it or um, are already using it and are not aware of some of the more advanced things that you can use it for in practice or research. Um, if you do have questions along the way or something's not clear, then p please feel free to jump in. Hopefully we can... Yes, you can tweet questions, exactly. Um, unfortunately, we've been having a bit of issue with the Wi-Fi here, which is a shame because, you know, this is a Twitter session. So the ideal would be that as you're seeing the instructions, that everyone is in the process of signing up for an account so that you can get involved. So um, there's many different social media platforms. Some of them are public and others are for only physicians. This is a list of some of the public platforms. Facebook does have the widest global reach overall. It is uh, frequently used by urologists. We did a survey on this in the AUA actually and I mean almost 100% now of urologists have Facebook, over 90%, but many are just using it for personal reasons. So it hasn't had as much professional use. Twitter has had the greatest recent growth in use for medical professionals. We'll talk the most about that. LinkedIn is another common platform for professional use. YouTube can also be very useful. In fact, the videos from today's session are going to be on the ICS television. So um, if you would like to follow this or other content from the meeting, that's a great place. There's many other social media platforms. Most of them do not have as much professional use. This list is a few of the physician-only social media platforms. Doximity uh, is mostly uh, used in the United States and actually now is part of the US News and World Report rankings where hospitals are ranked and has a, a great impact for US hospitals. So interesting that even they're starting to look at social media for metrics. Social media is continuing to grow worldwide. These are just some statistics on how many users some of these platforms have. So if you're getting involved, it's a great way to broadcast yourself, your work, any other cause that you're trying to promote. So we'll start with Twitter. Healthcare professionals have really expanded on Twitter. Back in 2006, when this started, there were only 23 healthcare professionals, and now there's more than 75,000. So this is a huge and growing audience. So if you want to get started, you can go on your phone or tablet and download the Twitter app. Or on the computer, just go to the page, twitter.com, and you can sign up with your name and email. This is what you do first. You choose your Twitter name. So this could be anything you want. I think having it be a part of your name is nice. Mine is Loeb Stacy because Stacy Loeb was already taken. Uh, so if you can come up with some variation on your name, or you could have something else. One of my colleagues is Uretiric Bud because he thought that was funny from you know the um, development of the urinary tract. So whatever it is that speaks to you, that would be a very individual name. The only recommendation I have is to make it as short as you possibly can. So any version of your name that's shorter, because it's only 140 characters that can be used in a tweet. So if somebody is including your name, that counts against the character total, and every character matters. So people are actually more likely to engage with you if you have a short name, because then it's easy to include your name in. If it's 14 characters long, you know, doctor with the first name and a last name, it's uh, just too long to be included frequently. Then creating your profile. This is another very important stage. A lot of people who just join still have the egg. They don't upload a photo. And people do not follow you or are not as engaged if you're, if you're an egg. So they always say, don't be an egg. So you want to put on a photo. And it's nice, because now I have friends from all over the world who I see at conferences. And you can identify them. Oh my gosh, you're the guy I've been talking to on Twitter because you see their picture with their tweets. So, you know, you don't want to be anonymous. The whole goal is to network and, you know, engage with your colleagues from around the world. So I would pick a professional headshot and keep a good profile with exactly your current position, your location, a website, because 
the goal is to let people know who you are, and then like-minded individuals will follow you. So if you don't say, you know, um, so you could say assistant professor of urology or, you know, gynecology resident at blank hospital, um, you know, in Sheffield, UK. I mean, it should say exactly about you so that people know whether you're somebody they want to engage with. If the profile doesn't say any information, then I usually will not follow the person because I'm not sure if they're, you know, a urology resident or an ax murderer. So if there's just some kind of medical information there, it helps to let people know or research. Um, then you next step is just choosing who you want to follow. So what's nice about Twitter is that you don't see information from anyone except for who you pick. So this is constantly curated by you. So ideally, it should not waste any of your time. It shouldn't be a time sink, because these should be things that you want to know about anyway. So um, you can search people's names. Or you can look at someone who's already on Twitter that you know and look through the list of people that they follow, because probably you might want to follow some of the same people. So for example, you could choose, you know, at ICS office is the ICS. So you could see who follows the ICS and who the ICS follows right on their page. And probably right there, you could click on, you know, several other users that you want. Um, all the major journals have Twitter, so look for journals that you would want to know what they're coming out with. If you have hobbies, you know, a sports team, there's, um, it's a great way to get instantaneous information about anything. So probably everyone's feed is very random and completely different from everybody else's because it is so specific to you and your interests. This is some terminology. So a tweet is the standard message on Twitter. And I think the best thing about it is that it's 140 characters or less. I just don't have enough attention span or time to read this long blog from people about what they think. So if you can't say it in 140 characters or less, it can't be tweeted. So it forces you to be concise about your message and really just get to the sound bite. And if people are interested or there's more information, hopefully you can use a link. The feed, this is just the stream of tweets that you read. So like I said, it depends on who you follow. So if I only follow you know, the ICS and Syracuse basketball, my feed would only have tweets from the ICS and Syracuse basketball and nobody else. So if you follow 900 people, then your, your, list, your feed is going to be very long because some of those 900 people or organizations are going to have a lot of tweets. So how much you want to read on a daily basis also depends on you. If you find that somebody tweets too often and you can't keep up with it, or it's just clogging your feed, then you just stop following them at any point. And then you can get it back to how it's you want to be reading it. A retweet is when somebody else tweets something that you like or support or think has an important message. So you just press the button, retweet, and then it goes to all of your followers because everyone has a different set of followers. The people that follow me may be different than the people that follow you. So if you say something that I think is important for people to know, then I can hit retweet. And then everyone who follows me sees the same information. So it's a nice way to show support or help spread a message about something that's important. And then the hashtag. This is probably the most critical. This is like your search term. So if you want your tweet to be grouped with other tweets, it's just like using keywords for PubMed. This is how things get indexed on Twitter. So most conferences have their own hashtag. And if you want your tweets about the meeting to appear with the other tweets, then you would just use the hashtag. So the ICS office used uh, ICS2014 to issue some tweets about this meeting. Um, so I just tweeted something about the meeting and put hashtag ICS2014. And that way, if somebody wants to go back and see what was happening at ICS2014, they just search for that in Twitter, and it'll come up with a um, chronological listing of all the tweets that have been issued during the meeting. This is what it looks like. This is the AUA's profile screen. Um, so basically, this has the user's information, uh, their you know photo or avatar, 
Um, it gives some suggestions on who to follow, so you can get more ideas from Twitter. It actually has some learning to it. So if you follow um, a bunch of gynecology organizations, it'll recommend other gynecology organizations. So. Um, it helps give you ideas. And then the main page is just your feed. So this whole listing here, um, I don't think this is working, but <laughs> the, the list here is just the feed. So these are the people that the AUA is following and what they tweeted most recently. Um, then if you want to post a tweet, uh, you can just click on the tweet button and just start typing a message into the blank here. Um, so this is an example of a tweet that the AUA wrote uh, in reference to Men's Health Week. They added a photo. They have hashtag Men's Health Week. So this way, if anyone else is tweeting about Men's Health Week, so when it's um, the week that is for incontinence, there would be a lot of tweets about that, for example. So just using the hashtag so that your tweet is indexed with other tweets that are related um, is great. Also, including any relevant people's handle or name in the tweet shows them the tweet. So anytime anyone mentions me on Twitter, I get an email or a notification saying, somebody mentioned you on Twitter. So this is a nice way to keep tabs on who's talking to you. Um, this is what it looks like on a phone. So there's four different screens, and you can click between these different tabs. So the home screen, just like on the computer, is just the feed. It's what everybody is saying who you follow. So it's a, just a chronological list of what they're tweeting. So like I said, if you're following two people, it's not going to be a very long list. But if you're following hundreds of other users, then the feed may be very long. So it can be hard to keep up with it if you follow too many people. So it's important to be parsimonious about who you choose so that you're spending the amount of time that you want to with the best co possible content. The second tab over is the connect button with the at sign. This is the uh, interactions type of um, information. So this tells you any time that you're mentioned, any time somebody retweets what you tweeted, or any time someone favorites what you tweeted. And favoriting, they can click a little star that it's their favorite, and that's another way of either um, marking the content for future use or letting someone know that, that you like what they posted. So this connections tab is nice because you can see who's interacting with you. If you post, you know, I published a new paper in the Journal of Urology about um, mesh, and then you have a link, and someone reads the article and they have a question, they might reply to your tweet and ask you a question. So this tab shows you everybody who engaged with that tweet in some way, and that's a nice way to keep tabs on who's interacting with you and to you know, make sure to interact back with them. Discover, this isn't a tab that I use very much because I just don't have that much time, but this is another way where Twitter is smart and it tells you what's trending that might interest you. So, you know, if you're tweeting a lot about health topics and Ebola is trending, you know, this page will show you kind of what's being discussed. So if you were away for two weeks and want to know what's going on in the world, you could look at this page. And then the last screen is your profile. So that just shows the same information as on the computer, um, who you are, how many followers you have, how many people you're following, and the most recent tweets that you've had. OK, so that was a little bit of the basics of the nuts and bolts. Now I think the most important part is the why. Uh, and this is what we'll see if we can convince some of the ICS members whether they should join. OK, so I think it's very useful for news, for emerging research, conferences, education, advocacy, networking, crowdsourcing, advertising, and as a source of data. So it's quite a long list, but I really think it serves all these goals. So let's see if you're convinced. OK. So major news. So instantaneously, when something happens, it goes on Twitter. So if there's a new drug that gets approved, recalls, any other important world news, um, plane crashing, um, Ebola is in the United States, whatever it may be, that is automatically goes right up on Twitter. So I really feel like I don't miss anything. So this is an example when Mira Begron was approved. Right away, you know, hundreds of tweets about that from different um, news organizations. 
Another one here, this was just um, in the past two days. This was somebody tweeting about um, a Boston Scientific Jury Award about um, pelvic mesh litigation. So these are some things that may interest you. And this is the kind of thing that you can read about and stay up to date with on Twitter. These examples, I try to choose things that people in this society would find interesting so that you could see the kind of thing that you might get on your feed um, if you decide to participate. And of course, the ICS itself does have a Twitter presence. It's at, at ICS office is their handle. So you can all follow the ICS, and that, that gives a lot of interesting news. Uh, for example, um, you know, general secretary elect and a link. Uh, so you know, we're able to keep up to date on the members of the ICS uh, leadership and uh, what they're saying right here on Twitter. Uh, and you know, this is actually part of what convinced me to do Twitter because I was speaking at a meeting in Australia about prostate biopsy infections, and the um, the huh? Your thoughts are immediately turned to me. Huh? Your <laughs> No, because um, what happened is the moderators were, were on Twitter at the time, and I wasn't. And so they were tweeting what I was saying in the lecture, and then they said, oh, some questions came in from Twitter from people in Canada about my prostate biopsy infections talk in Australia. And I thought, how do the people in Canada know what I'm saying? And I just thought it was weird that I was being discussed on Twitter and that I didn't even know what it was or how to use it. So m maybe you'll have one of those moments, too, where uh, you decide, you know, I think that there's something to this. But you know, the fact that people can participate in conferences from around the world just shows you the power of it. And then I responded to the Twitter question on the podium, and it was tweeted back to the people in Canada. So this is what's happening now with every conference. People around the whole world are, are engaging. So yes. Um, you just copy the website, and it, it looks funny here, but it is just like www. whatever. Right. Yeah, that was entered as um, you know a regular www website, and then it makes it into this um, funny string of letters just to shorten it for the sending of the tweet. Um, but yes, no, that'll just direct you to a normal web page. So if you want to include a web page, which I highly recommend, by the way, then just copy paste the actual web link into the tweet box along with whatever you want to say about it. Uh, because that's a nice way where people who are interested then can get more information since you can only say 140 characters worth. But then if somebody's not interested, they don't have to go to the link. So you're not overburdening them with all this extra information that they aren't interested. So I think links are great, but you have to have some description of what it is, otherwise people won't click on it. So this is a great example here, because you know if you want to read the ICS news, then there's a link. So if they just say, the new ICS news is out, but there's no link, then you're like, oh, you know, I'm interested, but now I have to go search for it. So you don't want to make people work so hard. If you're trying to spread content, it's good to put it out there. Emerging research. So this is probably my favorite use of Twitter is just keeping up with publications because we're all just inundated. There's just so many journals and it's just hard to keep up with all the articles sometimes. Um, and I'm sure that that's a problem that many people face. And already there's a lot of sites that deliver emails, like Medscape, that summarizes some of the articles that have come out. Um, but sometimes even those blurbs can be very long to keep up with. So Twitter, I think, is a great alternate way to learn about things. New England Journal, JAMA, all these journals are on Twitter, and they just tweet short sound bites of the articles that come out. So you know, I follow the New England Journal, and most of the stuff isn't really relevant to me as a urologist. But every so often, there's something about prostate cancer, and then I'm like, whoa! You know, I'm glad that I knew that that was in there, because this is you know the next anti-screening thing that's going to come out or something like that. So definitely good to stay on top of, and it's very quick. I scroll through it when I'm waiting at the bus stop or in the line at Starbucks. So this doesn't have to dominate your day. It doesn't have to be something you do while you're at your desk. It can be in downtime where you'd otherwise be doing nothing on the subway and now you're going to read through all of what came out to see what you need to know about. 
These are some examples of emerging research um, in this area. So for example, um, the AUA was posting an article that came out in the New York Times about how Kegel exercises can be useful also for men. Uh, many of the review journals are on there. So Nature Reviews in Urology every year publishes some review articles about you know, important developments of the past year. So I think you know, if you were reading this article, it would be very interesting to find out what they thought was the most important uh, topics in female urology from 2013. Euro Today every day has updates. You know, so if you were interested in total pelvic floor reconstruction, then you would see this and you would click on the link. And journals are actually now starting to request tweets. So this isn't always even optional anymore. And, um, at some point, we will all be forced to understand and do this. Um, European Urology and the Journal of Endourology in our field are both requiring, not requesting, but requiring that in order to submit a paper, you have to write a tweet that would be sent out if the paper get ex gets accepted. Because you know they want to promote your work. If they think it's worth publishing, they want it to go on Twitter. So they want you to write a sound bite that could accompany your paper on Twitter. So there are some tips here, if you would like the reference for that, Grayson in the Journal of Hospital Medicine wrote up a list of tips for how to write a tweet about your paper. So if this is something that you're asked to do moving forward, you're welcome to check the Grayson article just to get some ideas about how to concisely write a tweet that would accompany a research article. But you want to try to gain interest, and definitely the hashtag, as I mentioned before, We'll group it with other articles about the same topic. So if it's about mesh, you want hashtag mesh. Incontinence, hashtag incontinence. And that way, people who are searching for those topics on Twitter will instantly come up with your paper. Conferences. So most major medical conferences now have their own Twitter feed. Um, we can never go to every meeting or even every session at one meeting, but you can follow remotely through Twitter, like I told you with the Australia example. And this is incredible, what's happening with this. I mean, this was this year's AUA meeting, just as an example, and they published in advance that they would use the AUA14 hashtag. So it was on every brochure for the conference, and they really promoted it. And ultimately, there were more than 9,000 tweets from 1,100 unique participants. So it's a huge way to see what happened at the meeting if you missed it or you only went to a few sessions. So really very powerful. And these are just a few examples. So the Urology Times is saying new marker of mid-urethral sling outcomes. Um, I saw an interesting presentation, so I tweeted about it, that of um, 11,000 board-certified urologists, only 5% are women. Um, so if you think something's interesting, you can write it on Twitter. And a lot of other people who are following you would probably find that statistic very interesting. In fact, that got eight retweets and five favorites. So um, there are quite a lot of people who saw that and thought that that was interesting data. Educational activities. Um, there is already a monthly urology journal club on Twitter where people write in over a 48-hour period discussing an article. And I believe that this is coming soon to the ICS. This is a nice way for everyone from uh, you know, young uh, trainees up through department chairs participate in these journal clubs. So it's a really level playing field and a great way to get um, kind of buy-in from people all over the world about what they think about a topic. Um, there's also other educational activities, at least in urology, and this is something that could be expanded in other fields, um, like quizzes. So this is an example of the Urology Journal Club. In March, we actually discussed a female urology paper that's shown below, five-year results of a randomized trial of retropubic and trans obturator mid-urethral slings. So over a 48-hour period, uh, there were participants from about 40 different countries who write in to discuss the article. So it's pretty amazing, and you just get a lot of different viewpoints. People ask questions. So great discussion. These are the urology quizzes, and this would be possible to do in any, um, any other specialty as well. Uh, like the, the example on the left is, you know, for trainees to learn what a hydro seal is. So in this case, it transilluminates. So, um, you know, this is a quiz to see if you can get the diagnosis. So there's a lot of potential for educational use for this, too. 
advocacy. Um, Twitter is great to um, support a cause to a large audience because it's so much larger of an audience than most of us ever have. Um, I mean, in terms of um, media, you know, even if you're in a, a newspaper or something else, um, you can't guarantee how many people will read it. But I mean, if you have a couple thousand followers on Twitter and they see your message and one person retweets it and they have a couple thousand followers, you can see that within just a few minutes it could go to 10,000 people. So the reach of this and the instantaneous nature is just totally unprecedented. So this is an example, I, I couldn't think of any better example than when the US Preventive Services Task Force recommended against prostate cancer screening, and there was just a huge outpouring. But you know, who are you gonna call about this? You, know, you, you can write to your congressman that you think it should still be reimbursed, whatever. Now, on Twitter, you can direct your tweet at anybody. You can write a tweet to President Obama, you can write a tweet to whoever, and, they may or may not respond, but they'll probably see it, and if enough people advocate a certain cause, um, then often it does get some attention because there was an outburst on Twitter. Networking. So it's great to um, provide a forum for interactions with colleagues from around the world. Um, and uh, this is just some examples at some of the conferences recently. People have invited people to you know, receptions on Twitter. Um, it's also a nice way to start tweet chats so you can engage patients, patient advocates, other doctors joining together to talk about a topic and it can really expand your professional network um, with a, a large group of people. So this uh, one on the right was a tweet chat that was about incontinence. So they publicized it and a lot of people from all over the world wrote in. This is just to show you how broad this can get. So this is just a map of my Twitter followers. I have a, a, um, over 2,700 followers from uh, 79 countries on six continents. So I don't even know this many people. I've never been to most of these countries. And I would never have met most of these people otherwise. So the fact that I could have engagement with people in all kinds of countries all around the world instantaneously is just really amazing. It's just uh, the experience. Um, this is for my profile. Um, no, my profile on Twitter is just a single profile. Um, I recommend, well, my personal practice is to have a complete wall. So my Facebook page is what I use for, you know, pictures of my family vacation or a photo of my wedding. And my Twitter profile is like my professional outward self because that's seen by everybody. Whereas Facebook, you have to be my friend. So I only become friends with people on Facebook who are my actual friends. And then Twitter, you can search on the internet and read somebody's Twitter feed unless you protect it, which I don't recommend. So I think you should just you know, maintain professionalism and just have you know, ideally a single profile where, um, and the people who are interested in the same topics as you and tweet about the same things, you will find each other. And it, so it just keeps growing. So crowdsourcing, this is another neat way to use Twitter. If you come up with a difficult management question in clinic, you don't want to give away any uh, personal confidential information about patients ever. So you would never want to say someone's name or age or anything that's confidential, but you can ask general questions on Twitter and often get an, a response instantaneously from other people around the world. So this guy, for example, was seeing a patient who had a family history of um, female members with uh, breast cancer, multiple breast cancer patients, and was curious about the link between BRCA and prostate cancer. So without saying, you know, this was a 54-year-old man who, you know, lives in you know, Waukegan, Michigan, you know, you don't want to give any details, but you can ask general questions, and people instantly wrote back to him with links to articles about BRCA and prostate cancer. So, you know, phoning a friend has taken on a new meaning now, because you may not know somebody who's an expert in the topic, or you may want to phone, you know, 1,000 of your closest friends from around the world, and that's what you're doing here because you, you might get responses from the UK, Australia, the US, Brazil, you just never know, and it's a great way to get information. 
So here's another example. This was a physician in the UK who said, you know, with your permission, can I ask a question? Who in their practice does urodynamics before tape insertion? All patients, some or none. So that's someone in the UK. Then Mike Leverage writes back, he's from Canada. So within a minute, he writes he's back. Huh? He's from Kingston. Exactly. <laughs> So, so we've got a UK and then a Canada writes back a minute later saying, you know, I wonder if uh, failure to ge demonstrate genuine SUI on Eurodynamics or physical Trump's history, anyone. And this other person, Philip Abosh from the US, writes back, you know, what his teaching was with a link to a PubMed article. So you can really just crowdsource your colleagues on what they're doing. Do they know the evidence? So great way to have an international discussion, and all of this took place in about five minutes. Advertising. So it's a great forum to disseminate information about anything you want to promote. So if you've got a clinical trial that's accruing, you can say, we have a new clinical trial for XYZ. And if patients are looking for that, they might come to you. If you're hosting a support group, you can list it on Twitter. If your research is going to be in the news, you can say, I'm going to be in the news. So this is a great way to spread the word about whatever it is that you're doing so that more people will engage. Um, so down below is an example. I host a radio show on Sirius XM on Wednesday nights. It's our satellite radio in the US and Canada. So I always issue a tweet before each of my shows about what I'm talking about. And that way, if people are interested in Kegels, male breast cancer, or vasectomy and prostate cancer, then they could tune into my show. But if I didn't tweet that, then people may not even know about it, and maybe some of them would want to listen. Um, this is another example. Dr. Shepard is tweeting, want to know about foods and exercises to keep your pelvis healthy. Tune in um, at 7.50 AM. So you know, if you're doing something that's interesting, um, and it probably would be of interest because these people wouldn't be following you if they didn't have common interests, um, then it's a great way to disseminate that information. So is Twitter actually fulfilling these roles? Uh, so this is a survey that we did, kind of a pilot study, Dr. Borgman and myself at the EAU meeting where we asked Twitter users whether they actually found Twitter to be useful for networking, disseminating information, research, career development, advocacy, and doctor-patient communication. Um, and as you can see, all of them were the majority of people felt that they were having uh, utility in these particular domains from using Twitter. The highest of all was networking and disseminating information, where nearly every person on Twitter felt that it was useful for those two purposes. Exactly. Well, you could, actually. You would say, survey about Twitter utility in medicine, and you take a picture. So if it's ever something that can't be described, you either include a link to another source, so if this was posted somewhere, or you take a photo. So what I commonly do at meetings is take a picture of somebody's poster and then tweet, you know, interesting new data about mesh complications, hashtag ICS2014. And if somebody would want to see that poster, then they can click on the photo, zoom in. So you can always disseminate information in other ways, but not by making the tweet longer. Um, and you know, it's possible that this can all be a good source for actual research data, because people are just very eager to give away all kinds of information on social media. And there's no reason that that can't be harnessed for some useful purpose, which is already being done in some other fields. So infectious disease, these researchers actually were able to predict where cholera was going to spread in Haiti before it reached certain places um, using official data because they search for certain terms like diarrhea, fever, and they showed where the epidemic was going and then correlated it with the subsequent data from the health organizations. So this is the future, and as we become better with bioinformatics, it may be possible within our own specialties to harness some of the data from Twitter to get statistics on what people are worried about Facebook. Uh, so the ICS has a Facebook profile as well. Um, the same with Twitter. You just want to include all of your actual, if you are going to have a professional page, um, things like your address, how to reach you. 
Um, that Facebook also has a news feed, just like Twitter, where you can read the timeline of posts that people put up there from your friends in chronological order. And it provides a place with notifications to see who interacted with your content. Um, as I'll show you here, some of the same roles that we can use Twitter, we can use Facebook, although I do think that Twitter overall is more helpful for professional use. But certainly it is possible to find out some news and research updates on Facebook, uh, like when there is an issue with morselators, uh, there's articles on Facebook about that. Um, the AUA this month was having a, a discussion about um, new guidelines for overactive bladder, so they wrote, wrote that on Facebook. So it is still a way that you can keep tabs on what's happening. Some research articles are also publicized on Facebook. This is um, Obstetrics and Gynecology has a pretty active feed where they have a bunch of articles that come out. So as with Twitter, you know, if you found this interesting about discontinuation of anticholinergics, then you'd click on the article to get more information. The ICS also um, in their feed indicates some new research that would be of interest to the members. Conferences are sometimes on Facebook. It's usually not quite as instantaneous as Twitter, but you can at least get some general information often about the meeting, like the program for this meeting was up to, up, uploaded on Facebook. Um, it's another place where you can do networking, you know, post pictures from the meeting with your colleagues just to engage with colleagues. Or you can also um, publicize things that might be of interest. So this was a, a tweet chat about incontinence. So if someone saw that on Facebook and they were interested, they could join in. Um, Facebook advertising, so same thing as Twitter. If you're having a course, this was the EAU was having a single port surgery class. So... Um, it's nice to spread the word in case you wouldn't have known about this class that was happening in Milan. If you're going to be on the radio, you can put it on Facebook. Um, all the same types of things that go on Twitter. And there's apps that allow you to post the same thing to both simultaneously. So um, definitely there's no reason if you want to that you couldn't just post the same content on any media. And it may also be useful for research. This was a cool study where they correlated people's interests on their Facebook profile versus the prevalence of obesity. So uh, cities that had people with more interests in activities had lower rates of obesity. And cities that had people with more interest in television had higher rates of obesity. So I don't know where this will head in urology or gynecology, but um, this is, you know, the future, I think, and it would be very interesting to see if anyone starts using Facebook for uh, research purposes. Other platforms, so LinkedIn. Um, it's always good to just maintain a profile on LinkedIn. This is really more for just a description of who you are professionally. So you just write in your job description. You can update it with your publications. People can interact with you. I think it's more useful in business than it is in medicine, personally, um, because most of the messages that I get through there are from recruiting agencies and things like that. And to tell you the truth, at least in academics, I think if I were to leave NYU at some point, I would probably know the certain places where I wanted to go in whatever city I was trying to go to. So I don't think it's as important, whereas if you were you know, maybe outside of medicine, where there is a broader scope of places, it might be more helpful. But nevertheless, it's another way that people can engage with you, see what your updates are. So it is good to have a profile on all of the social media platforms. And you are able to put some of the same updates on LinkedIn. So this was you know, um, a, pr a professor at Oakland, and he you know, put on there an article about lycopene and prostate cancer risk. So you can share articles that would be interesting to your followers. Um, when you get a job promotion or change institutions, that can go on LinkedIn. So it's a nice way to just let people know about what's happening with you. YouTube. This is great, especially, I think, for how-to videos, um, definitely in any of the surgeries that we do in urology or gynecology. There's tons of YouTube videos, and sometimes there's no better way than just to try to see how something's done, more so even than reading a book. 
ICS Television is an amazing YouTube channel. They have done just such a professional job in this organization of posting you know, real content from the meetings. So um, this is another place where if you miss some sessions or you need a recap on a topic, you, know, you can look and see whole videos of presentations on stress incontinence, whatever it is that you're trying to research. So YouTube is a great place to either look for new educational information or start your own channel. Um, the drawback is, like with anything else, some information can be misleading. Um, actually, some of my colleagues at NYU who, um, in the female urology division, d did an AUA abstract this year where they criticized a bunch of the um, vaginal mesh YouTube videos, and it turned out that the majority of them lacked critical content. So many of them had misleading information. They weren't all by physicians. So you know, um, you do have to be careful with any of these on whose videos you're watching and try to make sure that the information is quality embedded. So my tips for success. So as I said, your identity, don't be an egg. Include your information and your photo. Um, you want to post if something interesting is happening in a timely fashion. So Twitter is instantaneous. You know, you can't respond to somebody in a week. It is something where, you know, ideally, if somebody asks you a question, you should write in that day. Or if you're at a meeting, you would want to tweet about this meeting today rather than in a month. Um, be responsive and interactive. So even if you have the ability to have someone help you with Twitter and your practice in the future, um, nonetheless, it's nice if you can actually engage with people. I know a urologist who has a whole publicity team that maintains his Twitter feed, but when people write comments or questions to him, he doesn't respond. And it's just a one-way street, you know, him, 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 and what he's doing. But that's not how you want it to be. You want it to be a two-way street where you, you can tell people what's going on, and then, you know, you can write back about what they're doing. Or if they ask you a question, you engage. So the goal is to be social, not to just have a monologue, but rather to interact. Um, advertising things. So if you're actually publicizing something, the ICS meeting, a research paper, a course that you're having, include the link because you just don't want to make people work for it. If you say, we have this great course at our institution, you know, and then they have to search the web to figure out how to register, that's no good. So the whole purpose is to, you know, lay it out for everybody. And of course, professionalism. Um, we don't have a ton of time, so I'll skip over just telling you what's in the Code of Conduct because they're available on the web. Um, but if you go to the AUA page, for example, American Urological Association has a social media Code of Conduct. All of it is about just being professional, protecting confidentiality. You know, so you don't want to post pictures of you know parties with alcohol. You know, as a physician or somebody in healthcare, you know, always important to remember that this is permanent and it's your public image. So, you know, these are if you were in a lawsuit in 10 years, somebody is not going to look back and see, you know, a drunken photo on Twitter. Um, I think it, avoiding swear words, being courteous and having discretion. So even if you don't like something that somebody says, just like in an educational forum, there's a way to have, you know, constructive criticism without engaging in any kind of rude arguments. Uh, BJUI, the British Journal of Urology International, um, also has some helpful social media guidelines. Um, these you can also find online. But again, you know, it's all about considering that this is going to be there forever and available to anyone. And even if you delete something, sometimes, I mean, just this week, I saw something that I thought was inappropriate on Twitter from uh, a colleague, and I took a screenshot of it. And it was afterwards, it was deleted, I think, because it caused some attention. But you never know who could have a copy of that. So you know, you just don't want to post something in the first place that's questionable. So if you're questioning, should I post this? And the answer is probably no, because you do want to avoid impropriety and maintain a professional boundary. So, in conclusion, the use of Twitter in medicine continues to expand, useful for all of the purposes that I showed, I think especially 
for updates on the news, research, participating in conferences that you're at, participating in conferences in other countries that you couldn't go to, finding out information from people, publicizing events that you're having or things that you're doing, and maybe even in the future as a source of data for research. All the same could be said about Facebook. Overall, I think that ICS members should take advantage of the growing amount of professional applications in social media. If you want some more information, um, I wrote an article for the Urology Match website, www.urologymatch backslash Stacy Loeb, and that goes over some of the basics again. So if um, this was too rapid fire to figure out how to do this or, um, you know, that's a place to do it. We also did a free webinar for the AUA as part of our social media committee. Um, so you're welcome to check out the webcast from that. That's on the auanet.org website. And there's a Prezi by uh, my colleague Marnique Basto in Australia um, that's very nice as well. So in conclusion, Twitter has taken medicine by storm and is here to stay. The potential applications are myriad, get in on the action now or get left behind. Exactly 140 characters, so I have zero left. You can see the red zero. So all you need to do is construct your own now, press the button, and I will see you on Twitter. Thank you. Uh, thanks, that's a great presentation, but what are the pitfalls? Well, I think the pitfalls would be, you know, if, if you don't follow the professional code of conduct, um, there can be consequences. Um, there was a nurse at Cornell Hospital, for example, who tweeted a photo of um, a, an emergency medicine triage area after a trauma victim and was fired for it. So if, if you take a picture in the operating room um, you know, I've seen people post pictures where, you know, part of the patient's abdomen is showing because they're trying to tell that they're doing a new procedure. Um, that kind of thing can totally result in disciplinary action. So I think the main pitfalls to avoid are, you know, not doing anything that would break patient confidentiality and not posting any content that's unprofessional. Um, otherwise, you know, if, if you keep it clean and you're just discussing your thoughts on research papers, posting updates about conferences and what you're doing, I really don't think that there's any negative that could come of that. In fact, the, the benefits have been huge. I feel like I am so up to date on everything much more easily than in the past in terms of research, meetings, and have made hundreds of new friends. You know, we even have meet meetings now at, you know, all of the urology conferences like Tweet Ups, where, you know, we all go out together with the people we met on Twitter. And these are a very random group of people from all over. So it's just a nice way to meet new friends, e even within your own profession. Yes. Right. Well, you know, if you feel more comfortable initially, you can start as a passive follower. And a lot of people will do that, where they'll join, and they just follow some of the journals and societies, and they decide that they're not going to post any content. So you can just use it for the benefit of receiving the news and just be a passive receiver. Um, but you know, you can get engaged as much as you want. I think that it's unlikely that as many people will follow you, though, if you don't tweet you know, maybe at least once um, every one to two weeks. Um, ideally, it would be once a day. Um, but there's also a too much tweeting. So there is a curve to this, just like with everything else. So if you're too few, people will eventually see that you're not active and it's not interesting. So then a lot of people stop following you or you don't gain a lot of new followers. But if you tweet constantly, 
that's annoying to people too. So there's a few urologists I know that at the meetings they'll tweet, you know, standing in line for lunch, you know, too long a wait, hashtag AUA14. And, you know, people don't want to know what I ate for breakfast. People in Australia don't care if my flight to whatever got delayed. So I think if you are very parsimonious, where you choose carefully, and if you think that it's a very important new study that people should read about, that's what you tweet. So if you avoid things like what I'm eating for lunch and those sorts of miscellaneous random tweets and you just keep it to very focused tweets on stuff that would truly be of global interest, then I think that's the way to gain the most followers. Yes. Not at all. Any word you want. And some people even string together words, so you can even make a joke. So a lot of people will not only use it as an indexing thing, but will also, you know, they'll say, like, hashtag, you know, hot in here, all as one word, or whatever, you know, just they'll make some kind of joke comment with a hashtag in front of it. So it can be serious or not serious. But yes, you don't have to choose from like a list of key words. And if enough people use the same hashtag, then you know um, it becomes a whole string of tweets that can be looked at later. So it really is a nice way to group things together. And many of the disease conditions already have hashtags. There's this service called Simpler that already index. So like hashtag incontinence is already a hashtag. So if you write with that hashtag, they're already collecting metrics on all tweets related to incontinence. Um, so you may find that some of the things that you would be tweeting about probably already have common hashtags anyway. Um, well, Facebook, I only accept my friends as friends. So a patient couldn't become my friend on Facebook because I don't want them to see my family photos and things like that. But if I had a professional page, people could like the page. Um, so that's something that you have to decide. Um, for me, I just use Facebook personally, and a patient couldn't possibly. Um, for Twitter, anyone in the world can follow me. So um, there's I do have patients, um, mostly there are other healthcare professionals. Um, people in the media follow me, a bunch of you know, science reporters, so sometimes if I tweet about something interesting, I get contacted by rec reporters to give interviews about it. So I mean, there's all kinds of people from disciplines. Oh, biotech traders, that's another one. I have a bunch of followers who are biotech stock traders because they want to keep touch with what the medical people are doing. Um, so you never know, but actually the point of all of this is that if you are just professional and you keep your content parsimonious and useful, then it really shouldn't matter who it is. You know, I'm not embarrassed if a patient is following me because I make sure that nothing that shows any indiscretion would go on Twitter to begin with. So, you know, I think if, if you do follow the code of conduct and keep it clean, then you know, it, it shouldn't make any difference who the people are. Hopefully, they just have the same interests as you. And if they decide they're not interested, they just unfollow you, so no harm done. One last one. How much time do you spend on Twitter every day? Um, for me, I think it's best to confine it to dead time. So, um, I mean, I live in New York City, so I'm taking, you know, subways, standing in long lines at Starbucks, things like that. So that's when I do it. So I think you have to always set boundaries for yourself and figure out when you're not going to let this creep in. And it can be tempting because, you know, it'll buzz that somebody mentioned me on Twitter and I'm in the middle of typing up my clinic notes. But, you know, that's the time that I work on the clinic notes, so I look at it later. So I think everybody's different, you know, so I guess I would say maybe um, 10 minutes a day of reviewing the feed. And if there's some kind of very interesting discussion going on or some people ask me questions that I'm engaging in, it may be another 10 minutes of, you know, posting links to things to respond to people. Um, and at conferences, it's just throughout the conference. So as I'm listening, like I was listening to their presentation about Twitter or about um, presentation skills. And I like the slide about, you know, 
tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them. So I didn't have Wi-Fi, but I drafted a tweet where I took a picture of their slide. I mentioned their names, and this is what they said as tips for presentations at ICS 2014 hashtag. You know, so that didn't take up any extra time because I was sitting in the room listening, but now it allows, you know, trainees or others from around the world to get the advice that was given here in Rio de Janeiro.